I bumped into the general last week. We were both in the pharmacy queuing for prescriptions. We spoke about the weather in May and our hopes for June and the prospect of imminent holidays. This is a memory now from last year. And I suppose it's coming to the end of February. This is probably the last weekend in February. And I always feel once you get into March, the winter is over. You're really, you're just on the cusp of Patrick's Day and the equinox. And you can cheer yourself up with the notion that you're into the summer. Which is a lovely thing to look forward to. So I thought maybe for the end of this, for the market of the end of February, I'd just share a couple of reflections, random reflections. This is just a memory of the general. It was last summer, it was May, and there we were in the chemist, queuing for prescriptions, talking about the weather and the prospects for June. Did you cut the grass yet, I wondered. No, he replied, as you suggested, I let the dandelions flourish in order to assist the bees. Not that I saw many bees yet, just midges. We didn't mention any details about what tablets either of us was on. The fact is, we were waiting for our tablets, and tablets are an intimate record of a person's physical and mental condition. Only the pharmacist knows how fragile I am or how precariously I hold myself together with various chemical remedies. So we both held our tongues until the queue was over, and then we left the shop together with little paper bundles full of pill boxes beneath our arms, like children going home from school with an assortment of sweets. The general suggested coffee, so we went across the road and sat at an open-air restaurant. We ordered Americanos, while the general examined his bag and laid the pill boxes on the table. He was checking each item against the receipt. I paid over 83 euros for this month's supply, he declared. I want to make sure the money corresponds with the items on the prescription. The coffee arrived, and the heavens opened all at the same time, and we made a flurry to gather up our stuff and go inside the restaurant for shelter. I picked up a few of his medicines from the table, but in the panic his receipt was blown away, and as he went to grab it, he scattered my entire bag of goodies all across the pavement. The little boxes landed in puddles near the gutter and grew soggy by the second, so we gathered them as fast as we could into his bag. When we got inside, we were tasked with sorting everything out, going through each item to check which name was on the label, his or mine. Most of my tablets are white, with a few burgundy-coloured fellows, as big as Smarties and shaped like tiny rugby balls. I also take great big grey coloured capsules and powders from a variety of sachets. But both of us possessed a number of identical substances, apart from the difference in strength. For example, statins. These statins are 40 milligram, I remarked, holding up a box. Oh, they must be yours, he said. Mine are 80 milligrams. That kind of thing. This was a level of intimacy we had not bargained for. But on we went, scrutinising by soprolol, candesartan and aspirin, comparing and contrasting strengths as we divided everything into two separate piles. My goodness, he exclaimed, holding up a bottle of Avon skin so soft. You're using moisturiser. Ah, yes, he confessed. That's for the midges. There's nothing better for keeping them at bay. Not that I remember the general ever being bothered by midges before. I often saw him at a barbecue in his vest and shorts, roaring like an officer in the army in a 19th century jungle 
declaring that he was untouchable. I even saw him in the garden in Mullingar one summer, bent over a lilac bush, with the pale moon of his backside exposed above the rim of his trousers, and a squadron of midges around his arse, attempting to penetrate his hide without the slightest success. He even had a theory about why that was the case. It's only the female of the species that bites, he assured me, and they don't like testosterone, so I'm safe as long as I reek of strong male juices. But the bravado ended a long time ago. Now he succumbs to skin so soft and other moisturizers. In fact, any other ointment that might afford comfort for his ageing frame. We were almost finished, the coffees, almost done with the tablets, although the big fat blue ones could no longer be ignored. The box remained on the table with Viagra emblazoned on the side. We had studiously ignored it as if it might go away, as if neither of us should admit to it, as if we hoped the waiter would take it off like an empty cigarette package when he came to collect the dirty cups. Ah, he said finally, as if noticing it for the first time, and then he slipped the package into his pocket with a hand as swift as a lizard removing some small fly from the visible universe. Ah, yes, they're for a friend, he declared, recovering his decorum. Yes, I thought, of course they are. That's a true story. And and it was the general, it wasn't me. I wouldn't use Viagra, sure, I wouldn't need to. I'm a young man, I'm 70 years of age, for God's sake. Young and healthy. But the general was using them And I would say they weren't bought for a friend. But isn't it funny the way you can be very intimate with your chemist and and you come out with your little package of stuff and, you know, you wouldn't like people to be looking at it. You really wouldn't. Anyway, it's just a a kind of a, a little memory I wanted to share. And there's another one here. Do you know the way there's a lot going on recently about King Charles? Well, he became King Charles and then the young fella became the Prince of Wales and... And then the young fella's wife is not so good, not so well. And then there's Harry over in America, an eye on everybody. And um, I thought I'd share this with you. It's, a, it's another memory from last summer. Because, as I say, we're coming to the end of February. And I'm just, I'm just looking back on last summer and thinking, here we go again. It's a lovely time of year to think about, you know, growth and leaves coming on trees, and spring coming. And this is a little bit about the royal family, because I have to say, I've always had this nuanced affection for the royal family. I know I know their ascendancy. I know that the structure of society, where there were monarchs, was smashed, and it was awful. And we have a more egalitarian society now, Everybody gets a chance, everybody gets education. At least we hope that's the case. But there's something about the, the royal family to me. I'm, I'm a real conservative, you know that. I mean, even, even the fact that I like religion is a conservative position, really. You know, the, the, the emblem that you get in somebody like the Dalai Lama or the Pope to me, they're they're very beneficial. There's there's no doubt that I live my life through other people, and when I feel I belong to a community, and that we have a symbol, like a patriarch. It, it's not that he is different from me and richer than me and more powerful than me. It's like, in some way, I'm living my life through him, and then, if he or she lives their life emblematically then they're constantly in rituals that I belong in the ritual because because the patriarch or matriarch belongs. I mean, this is, this is true. I say patriarch all the time, but obviously Queen Elizabeth 
for 60 years was the monarch that you would be identifying with if you were, you know, thinking about royal families. And in Ireland, I couldn't be prouder of Michael D. Higgins as president. He's, he's just such a wonderful emblem. And when he gets up, I remember he went to visit the royal family in Britain. It was a state visit to the United Kingdom. And he was sitting there in Buckingham Palace with the Queen and he was giving a big after dinner speech and he was talking about how our Skaha Kela Awaran the Nina that, that we need to rely on each other. It's the way that we get on. And God I felt so proud. I, f- I felt I belonged to his presence in that moment. He was speaking for me. I felt the same hugely with uh, Mary McAleese when she was president and uh, when the Queen was over in Ireland. So I am a conservative. I like I like kind of figureheads. And I really, you know, the, the His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I say the prayer regularly. It goes like this. In this paradise of snowy mountains, you are the source of all good and happiness. O powerful Tenzin Gyatso Shenredzi. May you remain immutable until the possibilities of becoming are exhausted. It's a beautiful prayer. I'll break it down a little bit for you. In this paradise of snowy mountains, well, that's like, that's like Tibet. So, in a poetic way, when I say that line, I feel like I'm in Tibet in my heart. There is, there's a part of my heart which is Tibet. You know, there's, there's this landscape in my heart which is vast, solitary, and full of mountains, and the mountains are full of snow. And that's, that's a poetic way to think about it. I'm not physically in Tibet. I'm not literally in Tibet, but neither is the Dalai Lama. So I say this with a kind of heartfelt, imaginative sense of belonging. And it also gives me this sense in my heart there is a big space. Like It's, it's just amazing how the more you live poetically, the more it, it kind of heals you physically and makes you feel different in the physical world. So one of the things I'm always talking about is is that there is this ha- this space within your heart like a room. And you go into this room in your heart and open the door and pray in there. You speak in the inner room of your heart and, and God hears you. And and everybody knows what that means. It's it's poetry. It's not it's not kind of a description of the literal world. But yet we all know it's true at some sort of strange metaphysical level. So in the same way, when I, when I said that the first line of that prayer, in this paradise of snowy mountains, it's like, I'm not just going into my heart where there's a room, I'm, I'm now going into my heart where, you know, there's a vast landscape as big as Europe, with mountains full of snow. It's a beautiful way to feel that, that, that there is inside you this huge landscape. And in that landscape, there is His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So in, in this paradise of snowy mountains, in this paradise of snowy mountains, you are the source of all good and happiness. O oh, powerful tens and Gyatso. So you're saying that, that in your heart there is a great vast space. It's full of mountains. The mountains are full of snow. And in that huge landscape of, of your heart, the cosmic space within you, His Holiness the Dalai Lama is in there. He's actually inside you. And he's inside you as the source of all good and happiness. He is the source of all good and happiness. Isn't it interesting how in Buddhism they talk always about happiness. It's not so much like about moral, narrow pathways. It's more about goodness and happiness. And I recognize in 
His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the source of all good and happiness. Because because what, what we understand about His Holiness the Dalai Lama is that he is the the incarnation of infinite compassion. That's that's the idea of the, the Dalai Lama. The Dalai is the ocean, the ocean of compassion. And that's the source of all my, all goodness. When I do a good deed, I don't see that me as an individual in this lifetime is doing that deed, but it's kind of the fruit of the merit that I have accumulated in past lives. And all that goes back to some source, some perfection of goodness. If you could imagine, I have like a, a, a little speck of goodness in the universe of goodness. In the ocean of goodness, I have just a drop of goodness. But it's not my drop. It's like it is only good in me because I'm manifesting just a speck of the ocean. And then I say that the, the Dalai Lama is the complete fullness of this compassion. The complete manifestation. And then I say, the Dalai Lama resides within me. So it, it's, it's a very beautiful way to kind of poetically think about your own goodness. We don't often think about our own goodness. Sometimes in the West, and even in, in the Christian tradition, we, we too often were thinking about how we are not good and how we must strive to be better. It's kind of a self-critical thing built into the Christian tradition as guilt. And sometimes it's very liberating to think in terms of Buddhist ideas where people say that, that you are full of goodness. And you don't have to feel burdened by that. You know, you don't have to feel proud. You don't have to feel like, well, well, if I'm full of goodness, sure, I'm a wonderful person. I'm better than everybody else. No, you're not. It's, it's, there's a source of compassion in the, in the universe. You know, the, the electrons that attach themselves to the neutrons, it's like a loving bond. The, the entire cosmos is being held together. It's here like a pulsating energy that just holds itself together in this beautiful and perfect balance within which we emerge. And you can't but say, this is good, this is beautiful. You can't but say, when you look at the spring, when you look at the, the little daffodils are coming up now, little heads, little yellow heads in those daffodils, and the two cats are, are moving around and and sometimes going out under the full moon last night, they're out wandering. One of them's out wandering, and the other one's wandering the house looking for the fella who's gone out. Because, because poor old Peabody, the blind cat, doesn't go out. and He's lonely when Charlie goes out. He wanders around the house in the middle of the night crying because he's lonely. Where's Charlie? You think of all the love that's in there with, with, with two animals. And you hear it in the mornings now. You hear it in the, in the kind of beginning of the dawn chorus, beginning now. And you see, you see the magpie. I saw him yesterday with the big twig in his jaw, in his beak. And, and there's this sense of goodness. And, and if you can, can realise, as you sit there listening to this or walking on the, the pathway, whatever you're doing, if you can realise that you, you yourself now, and I'm talking to you, you are a mountain of goodness. You're, you're a mountain of goodness. Like you're huge in your goodness and your power. It's like vast what you can do. And you can own that. You can accept it. You can, you can feel, I am a good person. And it's, it's not sentimental and it's, it is true. You are, you are full of goodness. And there's no need to be burdened by any sense that, you know, maybe that 
that's very prideful, maybe that's very arrogant to think like that. No, it's not, because the goodness that you think about in in terms of of Buddhist ideas is is the goodness that is there in the, in the cosmos. You're just manifesting it. You're just channeling it. it might be only a speck of it that you're channeling, ch- channeling, but the way that the Dalai Lama works is that within Tibetan Buddhism, he's the focus for everybody. He becomes like the president or the queen or the king. He becomes the one to whom we belong. His goodness. And so he manifests complete compassion. In this paradise of snowy mountains, you are the source of all good and happiness. And that's just one of the wonderful things about Buddhism, that it constantly is reminding you to experience joy, you know, to experience happiness. And I know, again, if you work your way into a deep relationship with Christ, you will find happiness. Because that's the nature of the relationship. But but in in Buddhism, sometimes it's 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 like more obvious to us because it's like you can hear it clearer from a distance. It's like you know the way they say the far the far away hills are greener. Well, in philosophical terms, sometimes in in the philosophy of our own tradition within Europe, we've gone deaf to the mystery and beauty and joy of the Christian story. And sometimes, if you if you contemplate on a few Buddhist ideas, you can hear the message clearer. The message that this cosmos is a miracle and you are the cosmos. You belong in the cosmos and the cosmos is within you too, in your imaginational heart. So we say in this paradise of snowy mountains, you are the source of all good and happiness. O powerful Tenzin Gyatso Shinredzi. Now Shinredzi is the God of compassion, the Buddha of compassion. Tenzin Gyatso is the kind of name, the way you speak about the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama is only a title, so who is, who is the Dalai Lama? Tenzin Gyatso. Tenzin Gyatso. In this paradise of snowy mountains, you are the source of all good and happiness. And happiness. If you wake this morning and you're listening to this and you haven't thought about happiness for a while, I'm asking you today, think about happiness. Because happiness is your inheritance. Happiness is coming to you from the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama is inside in your heart. And in the same way, you can find it is Christ in your heart. And the same offer is there of happiness, joy. O powerful Tenzin Gyatso Shenrezig, may you remain immutable until the possibilities of becoming are exhausted. May you remain immutable so that may you be unchanged, may you be forever a notion of compassion. In every reincarnation, Tenzin Gyatso will pass away from this lifetime and Tenzin Gyatso will return as the next Dalai Lama. And this the endless cycle of rebirth, we will always have with us the ocean of wisdom until the possibilities of becoming are exhausted. In other words, when we have exhausted the possibilities of becoming, when, when we have completely ended and finished the process of evolving and becoming we reach just complete enlightenment. The whole cosmic 
the whole cosmic thing becomes one singularity of of light and joy. Poetic, it's poetic, I know, it's it's poetry, it's it's metaphor, it's not literal, yet it corresponds to the literal in a deep way. It connects in some way with, with the physical universe, with the rational mind. It's as if our rational mind is is flat and one-dimensional unless we have some sort of breadth and depth of the imaginal realm. So in the imaginal realm, His Holiness the Dalai Lama abides in the snowy mountains within in my own heart. And I say to him, may you remain there forever until the possibilities of becoming are exhausted because you are the source of my goodness, my happiness. And if you, if you if you correspond that to how you pray to Christ within us, as St. Paul used to say, you know, put on Christ. It is not I who live now, but Christ who live in me, who lives in me. Same thing. So you can put Christ there at the center and say the same prayer. You are the source of all goodness and happiness. May you remain immutable until the possibilities of becoming, until heaven, until the kingdom of heaven finally comes. It's a lovely prayer. And I know, I know, like every other podcast, I've gone off on a tangent because I get too excited. But the reason I'm talking about His Holiness the Dalai Lama, same reason I would talk about the Pope, same reason I would talk about actually secular kings and queens and presidents because if you get the right one then they become a vehicle where you feel a sense of belonging with your community and if we want to get on as as, as healthy people in Ireland it's good to have a president but if we want to get on as a cohesive amount of English-speaking people on two islands together, Britain and Ireland, that also needs cohesion and emblems and symbols like King and Queen and Prince of Wales. I think they're all helpful. So, I'll read you this little memory from, I wrote it last year, little reflection, and it goes like this. Queen Victoria was born on a fine May morning, long, long ago. And yet her shadow stretches across the centuries, and I feel sorry for the new king. His fingers are fat, and his age makes him vulnerable to the righteous, the righteousness of youth. And he was left waiting too long at the door of the abbey. You know, when the carriage pulled up, he was in this big golden carriage, and and there was a delay of about 10 or 15 minutes where he was still sitting in it. And there was a few photographs of him on YouTube and they said that like he, he was getting a bit ratty, a bit annoyed. He appeared petulant in the golden carriage. And he reminded me of my own father when he got grumpy on our grand tour of Connemara in 1966. I was in the back seat of the Austin A40. And I remember my mother looking ruefully out the window as she said, My goodness, isn't the fuchsia just beautiful? The house where my mother spent some childhood summers had a back garden overrun with blood-red flowers, fuchsia. She was probably nostalgic for the Victorian flavour of her own youth, with its shadowy drawing rooms, upright pianos, mahogany dining tables and lace curtains. I think it's fair to say that the small towns of Ireland aspired to nothing higher than such faded Victorian grandeur in the early decades of the 20th century. Even I enjoyed wandering around the avenues of Lord Farnham's estate when I was a boy, 
touching the glossy leaves of the rhododendron, a plant I associated with Queen Victoria. And I shared my mother's fondness for fuchsia, which I admired on the ditches of Donegal when I was a student in the Gaeltacht. My teachers called the fuchsia by its Irish name, Jora Jora Day, the tears of God. For me, even the Irish name had a tinge of Victorian melancholy, conjuring up in my romantic imagination the blood splattered cross whereon the pallid body of Christ hung, suspended between heaven and hell. Jora Day. The flecks of crimson petals were to me a beautiful poetic expression of an ontological conundrum, the sorrow of God. Such esoteric themes mirrored my own melancholy. As a teenager, I loved the poems of William Blake and films about Dracula. I mentioned this to a friend recently as we walked near the coast in Donegal. I also mentioned my dream. After the coronation, I had a dream about the Prince of Wales, his sparkling teeth smiling at me like an honours botany student. You spoke well at the party, says I, referring to the few words he delivered about his granny being in heaven. You should do more of that. Suddenly he drew me into his bedchamber, where there was an Irish writer stretched on the eiderdown and pillows reeking of whisky. What are you doing in the Prince of Wales's bed, I wondered. I am one of the king's men, he declared, what the fuck are you doing here? And he scowled at me so ferociously that I fled out the door and down the avenue to nowhere. The king himself, not not the Prince of Wales now, but the king himself, was calling me after me from another window. Get out, scoundrel, he bellowed. You don't belong here. Well, it was all just a dream, and my friend suggested that I had internalised the coronation and was using it as a symbolic language to articulate the pain of my own low self-esteem, my sense of worthlessness that rarely reaches consciousness but surfaces regularly in dreams. As we walked across the sand dunes, it was impossible to ignore the snails at our feet. My friend actually stood on one, and I could hear its shell cracking like a boiled egg at a breakfast table. Mind where you're walking, I said, for there were dozens of them all around us. Where did they come from? my friend wondered, slightly horrified. They're making love, I suggested. Not that I know anything about the mating habits of the snail, but I couldn't think of another way to describe what was before my eyes. Each snail had stretched out from its shell, and its antennae were distended as it reached for any scent in the air. Several had already found company and were touching other snails entwining tentacles and performing various contortions that are beyond my capabilities to describe. My friend, who is from Cavan, put it more succinctly, I think they're looking for the ride, says he, to which I made no reply. Although I wished the king had been with us, he might have known the species, the category, and the mating habits of the snail. They say he has an eye for detail. And facts were not insignificant 
in the Victorian age, of which the new king may be the last and final pale reflection. And I suppose it is true that, you know, no, no matter how much you'd want him to survive and, and be successful as king, it's pretty tough waiting until you're 75 for the gig. I'm 70, so the idea of waiting until you're 75 to kind of inherit the farm, it's Jesus, it's a long wait. And then to find after only a couple of months, maybe a year, that you have a cancer. I think that is, is fairly, fairly tough. It, it would be tough for anybody, even if you were only inheriting a farm and live in a private life, but if you're inheriting the crown of, of England, and you have to live a public life, and then your illness becomes part of public conversation. I think it's pretty tough. And then you look to your two sons, and one of them is a, a rogue out in America, constantly giving off about you. And the other fella that you'd be thinking, well, he's solid and grounded and loyal, and you find that he's burdened with a huge worry about his beloved Catherine. That she is ill. And obviously one hopes that she'll be fully recovered by Easter and that the king will get a good successful result from his treatment for cancer and that all will be well, as Julian of Norwich used to say. That all will be well in the kingdom. I'll, I'll just finish with one more, if you don't mind. I had, I had one more to share with you. And I'm reading this also, again, I suppose, because it's just coming up to the end of February, or on the last weekend, winter is over, and I'm full of the joys of spring. I can't wait to get out into the garden. And I won't be able to get into the garden today because I have to go to Cavan, to the Johnston Library in Cavan, where I'm doing a conversation with a wonderful poet called Danny Gill. She's a, a woman who lives in Galway, and she's a fantastic poet, written two collections of poetry. And I love going back to Cavan. And so there's a little bit of reflection in this one about Cavan, and I thought, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll read you that as well. Although it's mostly about, I suppose, drum shambo and stuff like that. Um, well, it's about, it's about a place, you know. There, there's a sense of place that I find is important to me. Cavan is important to me. Because I was born and reared there, and it will always be sacred land to me. And I've been here in the hills above Loch Allen for... 30 years, and this has become sacred to me. And Drumshambo is my town, you know. And it's lovely to have a sense of belonging. Not just, you know, you can express it through, sometimes you hear your president, your queen, your king, your, your holy person, your spiritual leader, your Dalai Lama, your, your pope. And you feel you belong it's a deeply healing and helpful process, for me anyway, to feel that I belong, you know. Sometimes I just do nothing on a weekend. Sometimes on a, on a Saturday, I do nothing. I just like to feel I belong here. When I look at the lake, I feel I belong here. When I, when I walk around under the trees, when I sit on the patio, I feel I belong. It's what you say, this is my home, you know. And so because, as I say, we're on the turn into March next weekend and then it's Patrick's Day and then it's the solstice or the equinox and then it's summer. So my, my, my thoughts this weekend have been turning all the time to last summer. 
And I'll, I'll just share one last little memory that I wrote on the 4th of May last year. I was in a pub recently when a man with a soft felt hat began singing a song about Drumshambo. He was at the bar with his back to the end wall and a hat slung sideways on his head. His eyes were closed. It was an old familiar melody with lyrics penned in the 19th century, ripe with ornament, compliments and archaic musical embellishments. It was woven into a hymn of praise for the dainty town in County Leitrim. A lovely song. Well, the wounded soul finished his song and bowed his head as other drinkers fell back into softly murmured intimacies. That was awesome, a young American said. And to think we're actually in drum shambo. I've often wondered what makes the town of drum shambo so endearing. Maybe it's the summer school, when people play music along the streets. Maybe it's the choir resonating from the church on the hill, or the burning candles in the convent on the altar on a winter's morning. Maybe it's the horses grazing on the slopes of the mountain or the boats that moor at Chetty's on Acres Lake. Maybe it's the hush in the graveyard where sleep the remains of 500 souls who perished during the famine. There are so many reasons for falling in love with any particular place. My father had a sentimental attachment to Cavan, but he was from elsewhere, an exile in an armchair. He would wind himself up with nostalgia for the Donnybrook of his childhood at the drop of a hat. He was fond of hats. He too wore a soft felt fedora and had a choice of three that rested on top of the wardrobe in his bedroom. A man without roots, whose shadow haunts me still. I morph into his long-faced double, and I only have to speak a sentence to hear his voice within me. I always hoped that eventually I could say I belonged somewhere. But my father's restlessness nestled in me for a long time, and I envied people who belonged anywhere. I remember when Charlie McGettigan and Paul Harrington won the Eurovision Song Contest and they were brought back on stage to sing what was then the winning song, Rock and Roll Kids. And in their moment of victory, McGettigan proudly mentioned Drumshambo. He was rooting himself not in the swirl of fame and glory, but in the place where he belonged. I once felt I belonged in Glengevlin, a mythic and beautiful region of West Cavan. I remember one warm May morning long ago when two tractors met on a narrow road in front of me and stopped so that the drivers could greet one another. Engines off. They didn't speak, but they sat in the saddles of their grey Ferguson tractors savouring the exquisite absurdity of a lovely day and lighting two cigarettes from a single match. My car windscreen was red with the corpses of dead insects as I waited to get past the tractors, and with the window open I could hear the hoarse croak of a cuckoo and remembered that I was lucky to be alive. There was a superstition that if you were looking at the ground when you heard the cuckoo for the first time, it could signify that you might be on the ground before the cuckoo returned the following year. The superstition was a way of delighting in the nowness of being. I am wondrously alive in this moment, was the implication of all such pishtrokes. The first call of the cuckoo 
is mellow and sweet. And I always feel exhilarated in late April when I hear him as he swerves above Loch Allen and across the villages and townlands on the shoreline that make a necklace around the lake. Drum Kieran, Daura, Balanaglera, Cormongan. And even though he plunders other nests, I remain on his side. I forgive him and welcome him home. Because where else could he go? And why would he fly so far to get here, if not for the fact that he too needs to belong somewhere? The necklace of towns around Loch Allen is completed at the southern tip by Drum Shambo. It sits where the lake ends and the Shannon begins. And I'm content there, in any shaded pub, like the cuckoo must be content in his homing, in his homecoming, though he cannot claim ownership of anything, not even a nest. The truth is that we can belong anywhere if we just give it a chance. And even now in old age, if I could sing, I would sing the praises of beautiful Drumshambo. Yeah, and that's that's me and belonging that that you I need I need this sense that the earth is sacred in the place that I'm standing. And it is that because maybe I was born there and baptized there and I call it Calvin Town and I walked around the streets when I was a child, that's one reason. And maybe it's Drumshambo because I've been 30 years here and, you know, I've had, I've had the joy of love and family life in the hills above Loch Allen. And it was a funny thing. Belonging is something I take with me so that if I go to Donegal, even for a couple of weeks, and I walk the beach, I probably will, with the help of God, walk the beach in Donegal this coming week. I will feel I belong there too. And that sense of belonging, it, it, it dissolves the hardness of my own ego, my own sense of who I am as a self, as an individual, right? When you're sitting in a cafe in Cavan or in Drumshambo, or you, you're sitting in the pub in Drumshambo in the summertime listening to somebody sing, it's like... You forget yourself and you feel you belong in the wider, bigger group. And that can be very, very liberating. It can, it can give me a kind of sense of joy in my own life. It was fierce attractive to belong, not just, not just in your real you know, birthplace, not just in your real home, but to be able to go anywhere. And it's a lovely form of meditation. You know, you go, you go out for a walk, but make the centre of that walk five minutes where you sit on a bench or just stand still and look at the trees or look at the parkland or look at the ocean or look at the hill or the mountain or look at the, la- the animals. Around, where you, you stand on the ground somewhere and experience the sense that you belong in this moment, in this place. Three, 13 billion years of evolution, of cosmic suchness, has reached this moment in your experience. This is you now, evolved over tens of thousands of years to have this conscious moment and to inhabit it like you belong here. I belong here. This is where I belong. And that leads you into the imaginal. It will lead you into that sense of seeing not just the surface of what's around you, but the hidden, the hidden depth, the heaven that is hidden behind every ordinary thing. 
the future becoming, the completion of all compassion in the universe, already manifest in this moment. This is because that's where you belong. The moment is anchoring you to the future. The future is the completion, heaven, enlightenment, whatever is the future final beauty of your journey. It's the now moment, it's this moment, it's this place you are, wherever you're standing. And I meet people like you who are listening now up and down the country in different places, wherever you are. You're meant to be there, you belong there in this moment. And that's how the outer world, I think, helps me express my faith. How the inner world helps me also is when I turn to my spiritual fathers or mothers, to the Dalai Lama, there are many, many great saints, women like Teresa of Avila or Julian of Norwich. I can, I can speak the same prayer to them as well. In this paradise of snowy mountains, you are the source of my good and happiness, O powerful Saint Teresa. May you remain Im immutable until the possibilities of becoming are exhausted. You know, because you are within me. Christ within me, the Dalai Lama, Saint Teresa, your mentor deity within you, in the great vast lo mountain ranges of your heart, in there, your mentor deity, all the time. So you belong, you know, you belong going inside and you belong, even then when you externalize it and you look out and you, you see the you see the land that your feet are standing on. And you know that, that that's the only the outer manifestation of what's on the inside. You belong here in this moment. And that, that's how I feel, I have to tell you, as we bid farewell to winter, and I see the, the spring just about to begin. I hope you join me in and stay with me for the springtime. And thank you for being here. Bye-bye.